Uh, thank you, folks, and welcome back. Letitia Baldridge has been the name in America when the subject is manners or social etiquette. She was a chief of staff for Jacqueline Kennedy, and she spent years in diplomatic service at American embassies and in exciting cities like Paris and Rome. And she joins us today to tell us why she believes that nice guys can finish first and how you can be successful at meeting and impressing important people in your life. Let's have a nice welcome for Letitia Baldridge. <laughs> Pleasure to see you. Good to see you again. Bob. First question right off the bat is this. Okay. Manners are changing a lot. Social etiquette is changing. Should I extend my hand to you, or do we still follow the rule that we wait for a woman to extend hers? No, the woman should get her hand out first. The man should get his hand out first. Whoever gets it out first is the winner. Okay, I'll it's accept that. Absolutely. The old, the old <laughs> rules that a woman, a man had to hold his hand back until a woman put out hers, is, it's hogwash. People should establish body contact in a good, warm way. And the handshake is the way to do it, not kissing the air. Air kissing. Air kissing. Air <laughs> air, you know what air kissing is? Did you ever see one of those phony people that comes up to you like this? Yeah. Oh! Oh! And, mm, oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's air kissing, right? What I, what I think is so yeah. funny is you've got a way to diffuse that. If I come up to you, That's and right. I'm an air kisser, you go. I'm, I'm going to go like this and catch you, and you're not going to be able to. You're not going to be able to come <laughs> close to me. I'm going to catch you and take your hand, and that's it. Well, you know, you've got a, 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 a wonderful book filled with some very practical information, because a lot of people wouldn't think that you could actually read a book and improve your social life. But we're going to follow some things here, and we'll show you exactly why this can be helpful. Let's take a basic test on whether or not you are boring, OK? <laughs> One, do you drag out a story? Do you no. talk too slowly? <laughs> Do you find yourself rambling? Do the eyes of the person you're talking to glaze over? Is your language peppered with cliches? Like, I could just see the people in our audience say, well, that is really groovy. I mean, that's, that's right where you are. So anyway, how do you give yourself a boring test, and how do you stop being boring if you are? Well, if you, you do notice that people's eyes are glazing over, and they're yawning and trying to get out of the room. You know you're boring. <laughs> you're in trouble. You're in trouble. I think you have to learn to be a good conversationalist. You've got to have something to talk about. You have to have something affirmative to talk about or funny. Make people feel good. Don't bring up the subject of abortions, the stock market crash, the terrible disasters in Ethiopia. Don't talk about that. Talk about upbeat things. Letitia, are you then saying if you're going to a party or going to someone's house for dinner or going out with a group of people, you should have a pre-planned kind of yes, set of if, agenda? If you're shy and painfully shy, and a lot of people are, Bill. You're not, but a lot of people are. If you write down a list of subjects that you can talk about comfortably and that are attractive, you can then just program yourself to start talking about these things and you'll be, you contribute to the conversation. Learn some good jokes, but practice those jokes. A lot of people forget the punchline. They forget their, timing is bad. They swallow the major part of the story. <laughs> so I tell them to go and stand in front of the bathroom mirror and practice telling the story to yourself. You're your worst audience. If you can stand in front of your own mirror and tell a story and tell mm. it well and smile and laugh at the end, you're a winner. So you actually believe that pe people can actually practice to make themselves popular? Oh, yes. Yes, they can. They have to look good. They have to look the best they can. They have to think outside of themselves. You know, if you're painly, painfully shy, you're totally turned inward. Mm -hmm. So you have to start thinking out toward other people. How am I going to please somebody else? How am I going to contribute to the group? That's what makes you popular. That's what make, pe makes huh? people want to have you at their parties. Now, you mentioned grooming. We just so happen to have a few things that directly from your book. Let's start with uh, <laughs> women first, OK? Let's take a look at this. Some important things if you want to be more popular, if you want to improve your social life, you want to go so we start hair, neat, neat. and well combed. Makeup. Which hers isn't. <laughs> you're, uh, you're, uh, any, any thoughts on makeup? Blended well, excess removed, right. hands and nails in good condition, right. clean blouse, scarf properly tied, mm -hmm. slip not showing, right. <laughs> hosiery without bags and runs and holes, and shoes not scuffed but in good shape. You really have to look at yourself from the top to the toes. I love these drawings. You didn't see this over oh. here? Oh. I'll put it over there so you can actually <laughs> study that chart. I'll give it a test at the end of the show. Uh, all right, now the man. Well, he needs a hair comb. He uh, needs his de deodorant, and he certainly needs his face, neck, 
clean. You know, people think they can look like Don Johnson, half shaven and be divine and sexy. They're not. Well, wait a minute. Not why? even Don Johnson looks good. Letitia, half shaven. why? I mean, Don Johnson did shave for his wedding on Friday. I, I hope so. He that. <laughs> it was on a TV wedding. Why does he do so well? Why does Don Johnson, who, who has a, a stubble kind of a look, uh, become kind of a fashion setter with that? Not he wearing really, socks. He really isn't a fashion setter no? with most men. Men try to look like him, and it's so dismal that they, they're quickly told by their bosses and their girlfriends to forget it. Mm -hmm. okay. So, you know, he may get away with it, but most You've people You've got briefcase can't. on here. This, this is an area I'm very weak in. My well, briefcase gets an F every day. It's, I can barely <laughs> zipper the thing up. So I have to, if I have to watch scruffy, that. If it's scruffy, it needs polishing and cleaning. You can't go around with a briefcase that looks. No, as I actually have things sticking out of mine. That's, <laughs> that's my problem. Right, and now, socks and shoes. You know, men who go around with white socks. You don't have white socks. I know you don't. Good. Uh, you know. <laughs> and you know another thing that it, that men do that just turns employers and women off. They have short socks, and they cross their legs, and there's a great exposure of skin between the top of the sock and the bottom of the trouser. Mm -hmm. That's a no-no, too. So are you saying that men should wear knee-length hose or have garters have in place? Have it right up to here. That's right. Wear garters or wear those support stockings to stay you up. You know something I must, uh, I must say? <laughs> just, I never really go that far. I always figure if it goes up that far, I'm okay. But look, if it gets up this high. That's bad. This is bad. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, we can make some adjustments along the way now, right. can we? Now, well, let, let's discuss another, another very important area, I think, and that is entertaining. Uh, you've met a few people. The trend is not to entertain at home, and you really don't like that. You think people should just put it together, but people, people should entertain they don't know, at home. That's the young should entertain at their own home, no matter what it looks like. You should never be apologetic about your pad. If it's too small, if you think it doesn't fit your image, entertain anyway. That's how you bond friends together. You feed them well, and you can feed them very simply. I have some menus in my complete guide to a so great social life that anyone could do in 30 minutes. I do them myself. So I, don't, I don't spend a lot of time in the kitchen. Mm. But to give them some one good dinner, one good pasta, one good hot thing, a salad and a gooey dessert, wine, give them red and white, give them coffee and decaf, and sit down for some great conversation after dinner. That group of eight people, six people, is going to be bonded together. But mishaps do occur, and you're brave enough to write about them in your book. Oh, I'd like yes. you to tell the story about the time you invited people for dinner and forgot. <laughs> yes, I, told, I tell my own mistakes. I invited two couples for an informal Sunday night supper, and I forgot about it. And my husband and I were sitting reading the papers. And they arrived at 7 o'clock. And of course, I had no food. I, I couldn't tell them what I'd done. I told Bob to get up out of the chair quick and get them a drink. I went out to the kitchen. I found two frozen stews in the freezer, two little packets. I added frozen peas. I poured in red wine. I got some tired lettuce left over from the salad that I was about to throw out from lunchtime. <laughs> I added three new fresh leaves, which is all I had. I made a salad out of that. Mm -hmm. I got that on the table in 10 minutes, and they never knew. Good for you. They never knew. You know, one of the things that's interesting about your background, you've had to pull off some, in, you, in dealing with uh, Jacqueline Kennedy, being in Rome and being, and, and being in Paris, you've dealt with some very intense... High level high-level political situations, and high-level people make mistakes all the time. For example, former President Jimmy Carter did a no-no yes. when he was with the Queen Mother in England and did what? He kissed her. She's a motherly figure, and everybody loves the Queen Mum, and he kissed the Queen. You do not kiss any royalty. You don't even touch them. They, you can't even go near them. And so that was a terrible error. The English were very upset about it, but of course mm. he did it out of love for a, her, a and she impulse. knew, and she was very gracious about it. You can't, uh, you can't even write a letter to the royal family. You write a letter to the private secretary of Prince, the Prince, the Prince of Wales, or the Princess of Wales, or something. Mm. You, you did, there's a whole protocol. We have protocol too in our country, but ours is a lot freer than the royal families. Because, I mean, we see people hugging President Reagan, and he's hugging them and so forth. I don't know if Reagan and Gorbachev are going to kiss like Carter and Brezhnev <laughs> did. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. But just in a, in a formal case, when, when a president or a high member, you know, high-ranking chief of staff goes on a trip like this, is somebody kind of with them in the wings 
saying, oh, no, yeah. look, Jimmy, when you go out there, oh. don't kiss the queen, <laughs> bow this way, That's right. don't say anything and sit down. Is oh, that really brief? Like? Oh, yes. I used to do this for the Kennedys, for President and Mrs. Kennedy. The chief of protocol from the State Department goes. But I'm going to speak this noon at the uh, lunch given by the Philadelphia Women's Network and the Philadelphia Public Relations Society. And I'm going to talk to them about how in their own business life, they have to observe pro protocol. When they have foreign businessmen, they've got to know to put the foreign businessman on their right. They've got to know how to toast somebody from another country who's the guest of honor. Of the, there are certain standard things that we all have to do in our daily business dealings. We don't mm. have to be the president of the United States with the whole uh, protocol staff telling him what to do. Mm. You brief the head of state before he goes to another country. And you have to brief your boss on how to treat the foreign businessman, or if you're going abroad yourself, even if you're going on a low-level mission to another country, you've got to know about that country, know its dietary laws. You have to observe uh, its rules and regulations. You don't, you know, bring a pork to a Muslim. A, 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 an American no pork chops and applesauce. Well, an there. American businessman the... brought the final deal to an Arab encased in a pigskin leather binder. And the deal was millions of dollars. It was for a construction company. And the Arab leaders in this threw the pigskin binder and the whole deal in the incinerator. It was mm. so disgusting to them. And he lost a $15 million wow. deal by not knowing you don't use pigskin in front of the Arabs. No wonder they don't play football. <laughs> uh, now, why don't we do this? We'll take, we'll take a break and we come back. I want to talk about why Fergie and Di got in so much trouble. Also, you must have some questions about how to improve your social life. At home, if you're watching, our number is 215-263-6620 or 609-541-0003. We'll return right after this. All right, welcome back, everybody. Let me show you Letitia Baldry's book. It is called Letitia Baldry's is A Complete Guide to a Great Social Life. <laughs> one, one other question on the, on the royal family. Why do Fergie and Di seem to get into so much trouble all the time? Of course, the fact that you call them Fergie and Di is a no-no. Whoops, whoops. It's the Duchess of York and the Princess of Wales. Well, you know who They're I They're royal man. highnesses. Yeah. Those two. Uh, they have the most impossible life. No matter what they do, they're going to be criticized. If she takes one sip of wine, she's criticized. She's called a lush. I mean, mm -hmm. it's ridiculous. They are too controlled and held in. And every once in a while, they like to have some fun. <laughs> I think it's quite normal. There's one other thing that's in your book which is interesting. I've never read so, in, in a book someone describe the art of kissing. But now things have changed a little bit over the years. Now here's, here's a video of the way kissing kind of used to be portrayed in the movies and so forth. Just take a look at this. Just a simple, tender hug with a peck on the cheek. Now you take a look at modern kissing as we see it on television. Hit it! The soaps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now. <laughs> you know, in modern day, you can't go around kissing people you don't know anymore like that. That's, I understand that's finished. That. It's a that's little risky. finished. <laughs> but what, 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 do you, what is your advice on kissing in the book? Well, my advice on kissing in the book is furnished for those who've been married to the same person for 20, 30 years, and you lose a spouse in either death or, or yes. divorce. My advice is you have to learn how to kiss all over again. You've been kissing the same person for 25 or 35 years. <laughs> and that's why I've offered a little tongue-in-cheek advice on how to kiss gently and don't do it longer the first time, longer than 10 seconds. Boy, my niece has called me up and said, Annie, Tish, 10 seconds. That's too long for the first kiss. But anyway, I've just given a little advice on somebody right. who's starting to kiss again. As long as you don't keep count inside your head like, one, two, three, <laughs> You well, don't want to do that. Uh, wanna... The girl's very bored if she's doing that. <laughs> You're in big trouble then. Uh, we have a couple of good questions in the audience. I want to go down to the front row here. We're actually, we're going to take a preview of some of our uh, viewer cooks who are uh, going to, one of whom is going to win the, the uh, microwave oven. Hi. Uh, hi. So just stand up a second, a a Astrid. Yes. What was your question? Um, I went out for dinner once, and I had an olive with a pit in it. I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know to put it in the saucer keep it in my hand, what do I do with it? <laughs> well, the first thing to remember is not to swallow it. <laughs> the second thing, if you're being really cool, you take mm -hmm. your fork mm -hmm. or spoon and put it from your, with your tongue into the bowl of the spoon or the fork and then put it down onto your butter plate or onto your main plate, on the rib of the plate. 
Okay. If you can't handle any of that, take it with your fingers, quietly, when nobody's looking, and quickly put it down. <laughs> what, what did you end up doing? Don't spit it at anybody, though. Well, that's I, what, I that's what my... I used to put it on the uh, saucer and cover it up with a napkin so nobody would see it. Well, you don't cover it up with a napkin, uh, because your napkin should be in your lap. Okay. You mean with another little paper? Another napkin? little paper napkin. I wouldn't cover it up. I would okay. just let it sit beautifully right. bare right. of all olive. Right. Just let it sit there on the plate. Okay. Letitia, another question. Times have changed with regard to smoking. There was a time when people just naturally would light up a cigarette in a restaurant or at someone's house. What are the current guidelines with regard to smoking in someone else's home and at dinner in someone else's home? Well, if you don't allow smoking in your home, and a lot of people today don't, you have to tell your guests that beforehand so that a nicotine addict can have the option of not coming to your house because some people cannot possibly go no. through the evening. If you do want smoking out of doors, you tell your guests, look, I have a patio and I have a, a heater out there and you can go out there. <laughs> or if you're in New York and you have a fire escape in your apartment, I fix the f cushions on the fire escape. So you really make it easy for your guests. Right. You do. And as a person who comes to someone's house who wants to smoke, you should do what? If you're a smoker in someone's home. Oh, you should always ask, may I? And never, ever, ever smoke during the meal. That mm -hmm. is such a no-no. And what about the ashtray? Smoke after dessert. After, after dessert, dessert. is finished. And if there is no ashtray on the table, you, that means your hosts don't want you to smoke. But you say, look, I am, I am a nicotine freak. May I have a cigarette? Now everyone's finished eating. And the hosts will probably get you, graciously right. get you an ashtray. What I like is in your book is you say, clean your own ashtray. Oh, yeah, particularly if you're a cigar smoker. Take it right out. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Another question. Yes, sir. Uh, I was wondering um, if you send out invitations. We've gotten uh, this probably more from invitations that we send for my daughter uh, to her friends and to the families. Yes about RSVPing, uh, you know, does. It, they don't accept and they don't send regrets, yeah. um, you and you no never idea. know how to plan. This is one of the great social malaises of this century. We have forgotten how to RSVP. Répondez s'il vous plaît, RSVP, French words meaning reply. You should reply to every invitation within the week. If there's a RSVP card, you should send it immediately. The young are not doing this. They're sticking the invitation in their desk drawer to see if there's something better that's going to come along for that <laughs> night. And then they forget about it. And then they see it, and then they go to the party without having said they're going. So teach your children, teach your friends to RSVP within a week. By the way, I'm going to be at Encore Books signing books from 1.30 to 2.30 if anybody has any questions. Don't leave now. Don't ask me which store. I don't know. Excuse me, Letitia. <laughs> um, I, I, one or two things I'd like to ask. I, when is it appropriate in, in, the, in the crusade to become more popular and have a better social life to lie? Because there are times when you yes. really need to stress the white the lie. Yes. Well, let's say you're stuck with a person who has you pinned to the wall at a cocktail party. Right. Your back is against the wall, and you want to get away from this person. You look at your watch, and you say, I have to make a very important phone call. I have got to call the sitter or somebody. I'm sorry, I have to make a phone call. Then you can get out from that person, but go out into the hall and mm -hmm. make a phone call. Don't, right. In other words, don't lie that much. Really make a phone call. Phone call. Then when you come back into the party, you can go to another group and talk to them. Speaking of phone calls, we'll take one call right now from somebody on the line. Hello? Hello? Hi, what's your name? Aileen. A uh, Aileen, what would you like to ask? How do I impress an ex-boyfriend of mine who's coming back to town in September? How do you impress him? By, by giving a party for him. Give a fabulous party for him. Make it small so that you have a chance to dominate the conversation. Have a wonderful little dinner. Have champagne. Have low lights, lots of candles. And he will pre be so dazzled by your hosting abilities that he will say, why did I ever leave her? All right. And then after you two get yeah. together, come on down and be in the audience because I'd like to meet you both. <laughs> Thank you very much, Letitia. Again, her, uh, Letitia's book is called okay. Letitia Baldridge's Complete Guide to a Great Social Life. And it's nice to have you here. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. We'll Bill. be back with uh, suede and leather fashions right after this.